Hello, this is uh, the second class of week eight for Botany and Plant Sciences uh, course uh, 031, Spring Wildflowers. And the class corresponds to Wednesday the 20th. Uh, we will continue seeing the sunflower family, the Asteraceae, in this class. And if you allow me, I'll just start uh, exactly at the point where we left. We left, we talked a little bit about uh, the properties of some Asteraceae to open their disc, the disc of the capitulum, and, and uh, disperse the seeds through the wind, uh, through the development of a um, uh, fleshy pappus. Uh, now we're going to see some of the economic uses of the uh, Asteraceae, um, starting with probably the most uh, common, uh, commonly known plant of the Asteraceae, uh, consumed in almost every society in the world, Lactuca sativa, the common lettuce. Um, this is pretty, econ in economic terms, together with sunflower, uh, the most important um, member of the Asteraceae, and particularly for its contribution to vegetables and, and in particular to salads. It's a central element in the consumption of human salads, but it's also consumed in, in other forms. The central stock of the lettuce is uh, very nice. It's sort of soft and nice and it can be cooked or eaten raw. It's consumed in, in a number of Asian societies. It's a really nice uh, part of the plant also to eat. Uh, an economically important plant that uh, I hope you have tried, I personally love it, it's the artichoke, Sinara escolimbus. The artichoke is very, very related to Sinara cardunculus, a common thistle that makes the, the, um, uh, the emblem, uh, the plant surrounding the shield of Scotland and the emblem of the Scottish uh, nation. Uh, the thistle is, uh, the common thistle is, is, is um, uh, found throughout Europe and throughout many other parts of the, of the old world, uh, Europe and Asia. It's also naturalized in California. You will find it in many parts growing spontaneously. It's, it's a cultivated um, a sibling, Sinara escolimus, has a very succulent flower with a big succulent stem. And we normally harvest the flower before it opens. Once it opens, you can see that it's a thistle. Uh, and it has, like all the members of the thistle family, it doesn't have ray flowers. Uh, it's not a radiate capitulum like the sunflower, but it's, uh, it's a discoid capitulum. All the florets inside uh, the, the capitulum are, are disc uh, flowers. Uh, we normally consume it in this stage here when it's before it's open and what we consume from the artichoke is uh, the stem, the base of the, of the capitulum, the, the disc or the receptacle, and the fillaries. We consume especially the lower part of the fillaries, the bracts, because uh, the, the insertion of the bracts into, into the stem because the higher part of the filler is a, is a little bit hard. If you cut an artichoke in half, you will see perfectly well the structure of the capitulum and the flowers in, in formation. You can see the, the, the inferior ovary and, and the flowers in, in, mid, in, in the middle of their formation. They're still unripe and they will be white and very soft. Even so, it's recommended if you like uh, artichokes to cut it in half and remove the flowers because of the pappas, the, the bristles in the, um, in the flowers, the bristles of the pappas can make it an uncomfortable sort of bristly to, to eat. Very, very nice uh, plant. Artichokes are used in a number of things in Europe, mostly eaten raw, but Italians make all sorts of liquors also from uh, artichokes, sort of vermouth type of, of perfumed wine that is uh, really nice. Uh, another, uh, as you can see, apart from the oil seeds, the big contribution of the um, uh, Asteraceae to human uses, to economic botany, 
is in vegetables. Um, a common vegetable, you see it in, in supermarkets in California now. A couple of decades ago, it wasn't that common, but now you see it all over the place. The, the endive, uh, Chicorium endivia, which uh, makes these, these sort of whitish heads. They're whitish because they're on purpose uh, cultivated in the shade. Many of these uh, plants are biannual. They live for a year and then they die in winter and then they come back the next spring. And if you sort of bury the head under a pile of soil, like the asparagus, they will grow whitish. They will grow, they won't create any chlorophyll because they're not receiving any light. And those heads are harvested and you can eat um, the bracts of the head. Uh, they're really, really very, very nice to eat. Uh, the common chicory, Chicorium intibus, uh, you see it in some supermarkets, they sell the leaves. The leaves are a little bit like the dandelion leaves, somewhat bitter, but they have a sort of nice tart bitterness. And uh, also the, the roots during the Second World War were used both in the United States and in Europe when trade was, was put in danger because of the, of the war and, and German submarines sinking uh, trading vessels, uh, the root of the chicory was uh, roasted and used in replacement of coffee. It makes a bitter, uh, perhaps not wonderful coffee, but a drinkable, especially in the middle of a war if there isn't anything else. And uh, a very related sibling of uh, the sunflower the sunflower is Elianthus annus. Uh, the, its sister species, Elianthus tuberosus, is not annual, it's perennial because it has tubers and it can live from one winter to the next or from one spring to the next, thanks to its tubers. Those tubers are perfectly edible. They're really nice uh, to, to eat. Uh, a little bit, they taste a little bit like artichokes and hence the name Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, the tragopogon, the oyster plant of salsify, we eat uh, the pivot roots. They're, they're nice and soft to eat. They have a, a certain, that's why they call it oyster plant, a certain fishy type of, uh, like shellfish type of taste that it's very nice. But of course, um, um, plants in the, in the Asteraceae provide us with a number of, of uh, aromatic and medicinal plants. One of the most common ones is a group of, of uh, plants in the species Antemis and also Matricaria uh, that all smell the same. They have this uh, smell like a little bit of an apple-like uh, smell, a fruity smell. And we know them as chamomiles and uh, we drink them as tea. They're also used as anti-inflammatory uh, for people that have local inflammations. Also, you apply a tea bag of, of chamomile in, into your eyes with closed eyes, and uh, it's, it's really soothing and it will relieve a lot of uh, um, pain in the eye from different sources. The safflower, it's a yellow uh, composite, as you can see, it's like uh, the dandelion, it's, it's a ligulate flower. All, all the florets in the, in the inflorescence are ligulate, somewhat spiny, the leaves. It was cultivated, it was brought to the Americas from Europe by the Dominican friars that, uh, that established uh, in Texas during the Spanish colony. And they use it basically because of the color of the flower. You can harvest the, the orange flower and use it with rice instead of saffron, that is very expensive and difficult to cultivate, to make yellow rice like in paella, like in Spanish food. Um, but hence the name safflower. It's basically a flower that looks like uh, like uh, saffron. It's still cultivated in the States. I've seen it cultivated here in Central, sorry, in Southern California and a number of places for the oil. It, it produces a high quality oil that is used in, in a number of things. And of course, tarragon, Artemisia dragunculus, like Matricaria, it's cultivated as a culinary herb, um, like chamomile. Sorry, uh, is cultivated as a culinary herb. Herb, we we use it fresh and dry in the kitchen uh, to give a flavor and taste to a number of things. Its sibling species, Matricaria uh, tridentata, sorry, uh, Artemisia tridentata and Artemisia californica, two related species, form major dominant plants in the in the California coastal scrubs. 
but the one we eat is a European one, uh, Artemisia dragunculus, which is introduced here. Sometimes you will find it growing spontaneously, uh, very nice herb to, to eat. And of course, uh, in terms of harvest and cultivated area, the king of uh, all um, the Aceraceae as a crop is um, the sunflower, Eliantus annus. Eliantus is really interesting. It's a, it, the, the, in its wide form, uh, the, the ancestor of cultivated sunflower is a plant from the United States. Uh, it's native to the United States. It's, it's pretty the, the biggest, you know, in the same way as uh, Central Mexico and Central America produced um, corn or the Andes were from Ecuador to Bolivia and Peru produced uh, potatoes um, or um, in, in Southeast Asia and China, uh, also parts of India are the centers of origin of rice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about center of origin of crops when we talk about um, cereals. But in the same way, the sunflower is a, uh, it has center of origin in the United States and wild sunflower is very common in, in, um, in California, you see it on the side of the roads in many parts of the state. Uh, however, and this is not a photo from California, this is Russia. You can see the old traditional Russian uh, village building in the back. Uh, the country that cultivates the most sunflowers is Russia. And uh, it, it, it has been like that for, for over a century. Uh, Russians imported sunflower from the United States and started cultivating it in, in huge amounts, uh, basically in order to make oil. Uh, the main product of sunflower is oil. We'll talk about Nikolai Vavilov when we talk about cereals later, but uh, there was this genius of genetics and crop improvement, Nikolai Vavilov, that lived in Russia in the first half of the 20th century. And he devoted a huge effort to bringing wild relatives of crops into a seed bank in Russia. He was the inventor of the concept of seed banks. And he came to the United States, apart from going to many other parts of the world, to collect seeds of sunflower uh, in order to make crosses and improve the agricultural properties of uh, sunflower in Russia. Apart from the oil, sunflower, there's a tradition from the times of the Tsars of uh, eating sunflower seed in, um, in, in, in Russia. Uh, this is a photo of some uh, Russian youth working in the reconstruction of a bombed uh, city, probably St. Petersburg, but I wouldn't know in detail, after the defeat of the German invasion. And as you can see, they're snacking on, on sunflower. It's a very, very um, sort of rooted tradition in, in Russia, uh, eating sunflower seeds as a, as a snack. Even to this day, here a photo of uh, President Putin um, and his premier uh, both uh, trying different sunflower seed in an agricultural show in, in Russia. Uh, sunflower in the United States, we basically use it to make sunflower bread, which is not made entirely of sunflower. It's a mixture of sunflower seed that gives it an oily, very nice taste uh, together with wheat. Sunflower oil is also used to make uh, marsh, to make uh, margarine. Uh, and of course, uh, although not in the amount uh, that the Russians snack, we also snack, snack on, on sunflower seeds. The Aceraceae are, together with the, probably more than the rose family, they're, it's a king family of, of flowers, of ornamental plants. So we have the genus Aster, the daisies, the genus uh, Dahlia, the chrysanthemums, uh, we have the, um, the cosmos, um, gailardia, uh, tajitis, and marigolds belong in this in this uh, family, um, and of course sunflowers, ornamental sunflowers in all sorts of different forms, and a South American plant, cinia, that has been domesticated and, and by gardeners and is highly cultivated in the United States. All these uh, genera of ornamental plants make the bulk of the trade in, in flowers. Uh, we call them flowers, but I may I remind you once again that they're not true flowers, they are 
really inflorescences. Uh, for medicinal purposes, echinacea has become very popular now as a natural medicine in the United States. It's used for a number of uh, diseases, uh, especially for, for uh, nerve issues, but also a number of others supposed to bring up your immune system and to uh, pep up your, your defenses and um, has become very, very important in the form of tea or in the form of echinacea extracts in the recent de decades in the, in the U.S. One interesting thing, there is one um, um, member of the family, the sagebrush, uh, in the genus Ambrosia, also known as ragweed, um, that produces pollen that flies because many of the uh, Aceraceae, not all, but some of the Aceraceae, especially the Ambrosias, are wind pollinated. So they produce huge amounts of pollen that fly in the air. And during spring, when Ambrosias are in flower, when the ragweeds are in flower, they get into your nostrils, they get into your mouth, into your, your nose when you breathe. And once they get up into, into the high part of your nose where it's uh, nice and, and moist, the pollen germinates because uh, the pollen doesn't know that it's not on, on a female stigma of a, of a flower. Uh, it, it, it feels for pollen germination, the temperature and the humidity are just right. And the pollen germinates and starts growing, penetrating the tissue, trying to find an ovule to fertilize. And of course, your immune system doesn't like that at all. And, um, and so, uh, you get a, a reaction of your immune system uh, that starts creating uh, mucus uh, secretion and in general an allergic uh, reaction um, and that those are the pollen the pollen allergies that a lot of people get in the spring in some places in the United States like in Tucson Arizona the whole countryside around Tucson is full of, of uh, ragweed and sagebrush uh, the problem of pollen can get so bad uh, that some people have to leave uh, their, their place for a month or two until the pollen counts uh, decrease. Uh, some California genera, the sagebrush, Artemisia californica and Artemisia tridentata. There are two species that grow here. Uh, there, you see them all over uh, the place, for example, near Riverside. Um, we would have seen it in our field trips, especially in Swarthout Canyon. It's very, very common. You can see the, the inflorescences of small uh, composite flowers. Artemisia is wind pollinated, it's not insect pollinated. And it also creates some, some allergies uh, because of, uh, of the pollen. Very, very common in, in Chaparral. Uh, the common sunflower in its wild form uh, it's really interesting. You can see the wild sunflower has many branches and many heads, many capitula all over uh, the place. Cultivated sunflower has been selected for apical dominance and has only one stem and one very, very, very large head. But the wild sunflower is used to introduce uh, drought resistance um, or resistance against uh, diseases uh, on cultivated sunflowers. The brittle bush, also known as incienso, uh, it's common throughout, uh, you see it uh, entering the botanical garden, it's common throughout all the mountains in, in Southern California. It's a really beautiful plant because of the sort of uh, gray colored leaves. They have a dense uh, layer of, of uh, wax on the, on the leaves that give it that beautiful gray color. The golden yarrow, very common in chaparral. These ones are all past very rapidly, a rheophyllum, we would have seen it in Swarthold Canyon. Uropapus lindley, very much like the dandelion, it has a, a, a flower that is entirely ligulated, although the size of the ligula increases uh, in the outer florets. But instead of having a feathery um, uh, pappus, it has this sort of silvery blades in the, in the pappus that make it shine when, when, when the flowers have uh, uh, ripened and they are offering the fruit for wind dispersal, make it shine and, and that's really beautiful. Uh, the fleabane, Ariocharum foliosus, it's like a purple 
daisy. Some people call it purple daisy, as a matter of fact, also. Common all over the place in chaparral and mountains, also in the Santa Rosa Plateau. And the yellow pincushion, Canactis gravuscula. This is a really interesting plant, as a matter of fact. It has the flowers on the edge have larger petals than the flowers in the disc, but they're not ligulated. They're still um, um, actinomorphic. They're still radiate. They're not, they don't have a large ligula, but it has larger flowers on the edge. The corolla of the flowers on the edge is much larger than the ones in the center. <clears throat> the corolla is much, much smaller. Uh, the ancestor of cultivated lettuce, like Tuca seriola, introduced from Europe. It's a weed you see in Riverside at almost every sidewalk. It's fairly weedy. It has these sort of spiny leaves. It makes you think about the first people that started domesticating the, the common lettuce. Uh, this is supposed to be the ancestor of the common lettuce. Uh, how hungry they must have been to start eating these, this plant that is so spiny. And the, spiny, the spines are um, very irritant. They're not nice to, to touch. Probably they started boiling it or, or, or cooking it in some way. Uh, other introduced plants, uh, the golden yarrow, uh, Achillea minifolium. It's all over Southern California as an introduced plant. Forms dense umbels of, uh, sorry, corims of uh, flowers. The tarragon I mentioned has uh, very, very common to the, our other Artemisias, and it mixes with the other Artemisias and, and has escaped into the wild environment. Other introduced plants are the chamomiles, both Antemis cotula and Camomilla suavolens. Uh, the, you, you see them also very commonly in grasses in Southern California. And of course, probably as an invasive plant introduced, uh, the, the monarch of all invasives is Taraxacum officinale. You will find it in all our lawns in Riverside. It makes gardeners cry. They all want to get rid of Taraxacum but uh, it, uh, it's there, it survives. It has this amazing ability to disperse the achenes through these uh, fluffy uh, papuses uh, and can invade almost every lawn. Like wherever human beings go, Taraxacum follows uh, behind. Having said that, um, when I was a kid, my parents used to have an encyclopedia at, uh, at home made in France uh, by a, a printer in France called La Rue. And, uh, and the, the La Rue publications in general, books and encyclopedias, not only in French, but in other languages, in, in English or in Spanish, because it's a very, very big French um, editorial company, has this, uh, this beautiful symbol that is still uh, in in, uh, in all books, it's like the logo of the uh, La Rue Printing Company. It says in French, Je sème à tout va. I sow to all winds. And it uses the dandelion and a, a, a woman blowing on the dandelion uh, uh, akins to make them fly uh, as a metaphor of ideas. Uh, ideas fly very much like uh, like the dandelion seed, they can get in the most amazing places. And I always thought that that metaphor was very, very powerful. Uh, at the end of the day, seeds are packets of genes that propagate a flower. And ideas are, of course, packets of concepts uh, that propagate the way we see the world. And so I always thought that it was like incredibly appropriate to have uh, the dandelion as a symbol of uh, the way human beings disperse and propagate our best uh, ideas. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Next uh, class is going to be uh, Friday the 22nd. We're going to start seeing a fascinating family, the grass family. So thank you very, very much. We've, we're done with the um, Aster AC and we're moving very rapidly towards the end of our course. Thank you.